Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us. My name is Michael Spath, and I'm the Executive Director of the Indiana Center for Middle East Peace, based in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We're the Indiana Voice for Peace, Justice, Human Rights, and Intercultural Encounter. I'm also a member of the Palestine-Israel Network of the United Church of Christ. Today, we're delighted to speak with Siglinda Weinbrenner, the representative for the Lutheran World Federation Jerusalem Program, and Dina Nasser, Chief Operating Officer of Augusta Victoria Hospital, the only specialized hospital for cancer and kidney disease patients in the Palestinian territories. Welcome to you both. I'm really grateful. This is a real treat for me, an honor for me to, that you're joining us today. So thanks to both of you. I wanna, I wanna get right to it, uh, ladies. Uh, Israel and the West Bank are dealing with renewed outbreak of the coronavirus, leading to proposals and measures intended to curb its spread and mitigate the, uh, uh, the crisis by both Israeli and Palestinian authorities. The statistics in Israel, over 33,000 have tested positive for the virus with over 14,500 active cases, 340 plus people have died in the West Bank close to 4,400 active cases and over 20 have died. And the Palestinian health minister says that the situation in Hebron is quote, spiraling out of control. So if you could just share with us today, as of today, July the 9th, uh, where things stand and the role of Augusta Victoria. And I know you're very dedicated staff. Dina? Yeah, <laughs> well, uh, to us, it has been a challenge. Um, internationally, people discuss uh, access to care and Palestine is unique in that it already has challenges in access to care. Access to care for patients coming to Augusta Victoria Hospital uh, is challenging because the hospital is in East Jerusalem and any patient needs a permit from the Israeli authorities to come. We serve Palestinians from West Bank and Gaza. So again, that's another challenge for people in Gaza who have been under siege and the closure for more than 10 years now. Um, when our, and at the same time, the cumulated challenge became more evident as we serve patients with chronic diseases. With COVID, people with chronic diseases get forgotten. You know, they become a, a third priority because people are dealing with emergencies, acute emergencies and infections. However, our biggest challenge was how to maintain services for our chronic diseases under COVID. You cannot stop services for dialysis. We're the only hospital that provides dialysis for children. We have 44 children, almost 50 children now actually, that take dialysis and we're the only hospital. Trying to mobilize them to other areas was impossible. And we're the only hospital that provides radiation therapy. Radiation therapy, you cannot stop. I mean, once you start radiation therapy, if you stop it, you are actually risking outcomes for patients people will have a poorer outcome because there'll be more deterioration. And this was the biggest challenge for us as Palestinians in East Jerusalem. And Augusta Victoria mobilized to try and mitigate all the risks related to the access, yet still having to balance the risk with crowding people and bringing them into the hospital, into hotels belonging to the hospital under the COVID-19. Do you want me to go on? Siglinda, do you want to add to that or? Um, the uh, Augusta Victoria Hospital was very fast, I would think, in, in, in preparing for, for this scenario because we knew from the very beginning that we had to deal with patients that needed our uh, uh, life-saving treatment. And uh, at the same time, we had to make sure that um, you know, that the virus wouldn't be spread in the hospital or, but that, uh, that we had to treat the, the people. So from the very beginning, we had um, like a team, we, we built a team of um, the leading hospital uh, doctors and, and, and managers also. And it was um, like we, sometimes we discussed individual cases, hotspots, what can we do? Um, how can we um, make sure? How can we check on and screen beforehand? And um, also, I think one of the most important thing was to be able to uh, protect our staff because that was really very important um, to have the, the personnel 
um, protective equipment available. And we were very glad that we had partners that came to help. For instance, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, they gave us a grant which we, with which we could uh, start uh, uh, you know, purchasing um, protective personal equipment. Also, the, the German uh, Federal um, Ministry for Development and Cooperation, they came to help of us. And what was very important that from the very beginning, we also knew that it's important that we can be, that, that we are able to do um, tests. And that was really like, uh, that was not easy because, first of all, you have to have uh, the facilities, you have to have the, uh, the equipment, and most, of, most importantly, you have to have uh, experienced staff. And, and so we, we had this, and our doctor who was, who was in charge of the lab, um, we, we really worked on this and until we got then finally the authorization of the Israeli health ministry, because you, have, you need this being a hospital in East Jerusalem. Uh, and also you need to have your test being um, uh, accepted and, and being you know, registered and so on. And that took us a lot of time and the, the staff has worked tirelessly to make this happen. And that really helped us then also to, to contain the spread of the virus. And so I have to say that um, that the the month of March was so busy for us in in being prepared and and also training the staff, assuring the staff that they know what to do. And I have to say that Dina Nasa played a very important role there, um, being um, responsible also with the, with the unit of the infection prevention. And uh, it was a great learning uh, process for all of us. Did I see pictures uh, of tents out in front of the hospital? And uh, I guess I, in addition to that, I wanted to ask you about PPEs, ventilators, masks, uh, um, the testing. So if you could just wrap all those into a, an answer, uh, uh, that might help. Yeah, so if you, and, and what are some of the implications of what you were just saying? Well, well, when I said about maintaining services, the most important was to protect the patients first and protect the staff. I mean, actually, in fact, with COVID, everybody's talking about protecting staff before protecting patients, because at one point in time, you might not find enough staff to care for the patients. And uh, so we've actually set up tents because we needed some kind of uh, triaging area for the patients. At the same time, we needed an area to screen and treat suspected cases and ensure that they do not enter the hospital. And so uh, also we made, uh, we shifted our facilities and transformed one of our units into a COVID uh, center for patients who would test positive because we knew being in East Jerusalem, it would be challenging. Our patients come from West Bank and Gaza. If we had one of our chronic disease patients diagnosed, transporting them back into the West Bank or even Gaza is impossible, Gaza is impossible. And at the same time, even transporting them in the West Bank becomes ethically, I mean, ethically, we are responsible for our patients. So even if they acquire the um, COVID infection in the community, we would have to be responsible. So we may have to make shift area uh, for um, suspected cases. The tents were set up for the donning, what's called donning and doffing areas to dress up with all the protective equipment and areas to doff, to take off all these uh, personal protective equipment. And um, I want to sort of make, make it a bit more visual. I mean, the literature shows that there's three, uh, three prongs for access under COVID. People either cannot access their healthcare services because of the COVID and especially in March and April and chains of supplies across the world became disrupted. So you might have a disruption in medications actually and treatment. The other access would be lack of access, geographical access because of shutdowns and lockdowns of areas. And the third access is a psychological access, people refusing to come because they are scared. Yeah. Now we were lucky, we were lucky at our hospital that our hospital has a very good supply chain and had preempted and stocked well enough to be able not to have you know, a disruption of materials and stocks and supplies for treatment, as well as staffing. And what Siglende was talking about, even with staffing, we had split our staff into two groups of 14, 14. Should a group be infected, at least we know there's a backup group. In that aspect, we closed that part. Now, as far as access to services because of lockdown, we faced that. The first area to be locked down was Bethlehem. 
In fact, we have most a lot of our staff, I should say maybe a quarter of, a quarter of our staff living in Bethlehem and the other quarter coming from the south, which is Hebron, uh, south of Jerusalem. So we had staff not coming in and we had patients completely locked down. We mobilized after one week of that, we managed to mobilize and uh, coordinate with the Minister of Health Hospital in Beit Jala send all our chemotherapy protocols prepared in our pharmacy by our car to a point where the checkpoints were the Palestinian checkpoints for the lockdown on Bethlehem and coordinating of course crossing the Israeli checkpoints out of Jerusalem and delivering the chemotherapy through our staff who were caught in Bethlehem going and being on duty in the Ministry of Health Hospital and treating our patients. I think this was a model we were very proud of because we were able to mobilize and utilize the human resources as well as ensure safer outcomes for our patients. We had lots of patients, some of them are women with breast cancer. Should they have had such a delay in their treatment, their outcome would have been affected. The other lockdown, which unfortunately is very much inter intermingled with the, with the political situation is the patients coming from Gaza. Gaza to protect itself because it's been uh, under closure and more like a, imprisoned for 10 years by the Israelis. Uh, the Gaza to protect themselves, the Minister of Health, in fact, um, there uh, instituted a quarantine period. Any patient coming back from the, Jerusalem or the West Bank had to go into quarantine in Gaza because they basically could not afford one case of COVID in Gaza itself. It would have been detrimental. So lots of, and uh, so many of the patients started hesitating coming out and also access, you know, people were scared. So the patients of Gaza had the psychological and the physical um, barriers to access healthcare. We as AVH tried to mobilize. We had actually 400 chemotherapy patients, 200 were coming. We had a defaulting of 50% of our patient population. So we started to advocate for uh, uh, trying to secure the medications in Gaza for our patients as an interim response. And that was, uh, that was not uh, easy. That was a big challenge. And the Ministry of Health tried to do that by contracting an interim uh, um, service, which is now proving to be failing. So basically, you know, when you look at levels, let's say degrees of uh, oppression or degrees of um, people having the rights denied, uh, Gaza tops it all. So basically they are under siege then they usually have their access denied. Now under COVID, more access is denied and really the detriment on life and outcome and quality of life accumulates. And Siglendi has a few examples on that as well. Well, I'm glad you said something about Gaza because we've had a couple of questions about Gaza already. And I know from reading some of your uh, reflections, uh, Dina, from your time leading uh, Augusta Victoria's medical mission during the Great March of Return, caring for uh, uh, victims of Israeli snipers there. Uh, I know that you have a special place in your heart and Augusta Victoria does too, for not, not just, you know, in general, the population of Gaza, but for the kids, the kids in Gaza who need that kind of specialized uh, kidney dialysis and other, and other medical care. Siglinda, do you want to say a quick word about Gaza and then we'll, uh, we'll move on to some other questions. Yes, I mean, as uh, as Dina said, there are already a lots of issues for people in Gaza, even without um, COVID-19. Now, that was also adding, as, as um, Dina explained. But now, um, due to the annexation plans of the um, Israeli government, and as you know, that um, the, the Palestinian Authority, they have announced that they're going to cancel all coordination with the Israeli authorities. And that is also affecting uh, patients from Gaza because there is no coordination now, which means that patients don't really know how to, they, there is no address anymore of how to get a permit. And we started and uh, like NGOs and hospitals started to directly then, um, you know, be in touch of the, the medical referral offices in Eretz. And um, so, like I mean, we are we have, we have a unit in the hospital that are looking for at, uh, for the requests uh, that that issuing a request for permits for patients to come, and then last week, for instance, out of 140 requests that were issued, only 15 people could come from Eretz, and then the answer was from the Israeli um, medical officers there. Well, uh, there is uh, cancer treatment now available in Gaza 
or they would say, no, there is no coordination with Palestinians because it's so unclear. Like, I mean, July 1st has passed. That was the, the date for the annexation. And of course, we know that there are some delays, but the plans are still there. The implementation is just postponed, I would think. And there is a kind of a storm and there is, there is a kind of a lack of coordination and also the international organizations are not really, or the UN organizations are not really able to, uh, to, to cover up for this because, um, the, you know, the, the political situation is so unclear on both sides and, uh, and the victims are the patients. So we started to, um, to do our own coordination, but of course there is no oversight anymore, like an UN organization should have an oversight of who is denied and to follow up on cases. So patients are left by themselves, they call us, and we are also able to help. But um, with that message that was a false message that cancer treatment could be available, would be available for for, for patients, uh, for cancer patients in Gaza made the situation more difficult. Now we um, had meetings with the WHO and also explained to them that this is not the case, that even, even if they, I mean, you know, it's not something against the capacities of or the doctors in Gaza that would be willing to do the, the th uh, therapy, but it's just not available. Uh, the, the medication for chemotherapy is not available and radiation is also not available. And so we needed to, to explain to the international community and, you know, also like from case to case, also to the Israeli um, uh, officer that are uh, in, in charge of the medical permits to explain to them they have to come to us. And yeah. this is also, this is for children and for adults, and, and this is kind of a limbo we are living in now, which was caused um, by the annexation, which hasn't happened yet, but I mean, it's all in the process of, of this kind of political uh, conflict that we are seeing here. And, um, and it's so unfortunate that the most vulnerable and, and those people that really have uh, nowhere else to go are now bearing the brand. You know, uh, I, I, I want to I wanna just reemphasize the point that the two of you are making. Augusta Victoria is one of a consortium of hospitals providing medical care to the West Bank and to Gaza, to the Palestinian population there. Uh, and, and you provided chemotherapy for patients who could not come to you so what you did, I, I want people to really hear, hear this model that you were talking about. You delivered the chemotherapy and other medications to the checkpoints, passed them over to staff of yours who couldn't cross the checkpoint to get into Jerusalem, but who were, who were stuck in Bethlehem, in Hebron too, or in other- In other, Bethlehem. In, other, in, Bethlehem. In, in Bethlehem. In Bethlehem. And then they provided the chemotherapy to the patients there who couldn't make it into Jerusalem. Is that what I heard you saying? Yes, that was under the COVID, yes, for the lockdowns. Yeah, no, that's an amazing model. That's an amazing model and shows how flexible really uh, your staff is and your administrators are in providing medical care. Let's say more about, uh, uh, with the lockdown, uh, are, you're still under lockdown today, is that correct? Yes, uh, and, the lockdown took a different format. Mm. Um, the lockdown was very strict at the beginning, with literally curfews after 5 p.m. And um, then there was this opening up, whether it be it on the Palestinian side or the Israeli side, the whole country sort of opened up completely. And um, this was a few days after the uh, uh, Muslim feast of Al uh, Fitr after Ramadan. And uh, we were waiting for two weeks, thinking, you know, we're going to see just a spark after two weeks. Yeah. And unfortunately, it started slowly um, and gradually ri rising. And it sort of coincided with the second spike of the COVID, just as the whole world and the WHO and the whole world and uh, Dr. Fauci or end has uh, predicted. So we are hitting quite a spike. And although you said the numbers for Palestine, the numbers literally jumped from just below 100 to almost 300 a day in Hebron. We were having like an acceleration of 100% every day. Are you getting are you getting supplies to Hebron? How are you how are you uh, uh, providing medical care to the people in Hebron? Well, we continue to bring our patients in, which is has, ah, okay. been, has been nerve wracking. We usually bus our patients in, 
but we've had already two, three patients who have uh, tested positive for COVID from their community in Hebron. And this has been very challenging because now, in a way, although it's very tense, but in a way, somehow we now accept that we know we will find some people who will test positive because the endemicity is so high in the community. And um, a lot of our patients, our dialysis patients, adults and children come from Hebron. And we were looking at the risk. It was much less risk to keep ha having them come every day than put them all in a hotel together when you have no control on mixing. Because at first, under the first COVID outbreak, we basically accommodated all our patients in hotels. We had 120 patients and companions, like 60 patients and companions staying in hotels around the hospital to ensure the service. Now the lockdown is of a different sort where we can access people for healthcare, but there is no people cannot go around, cannot hold uh, weddings, funerals, cannot have parties, bars, clubs, um, the works so that people at least will not mingle too much. Unfortunately, the spike is not subsiding yet and we are seeing uh, more deaths than we saw in our first spike. And it's a bit more worrying for us as health providers. And we've had more staff infected from patients than uh, uh, you know before they get diagnosed although we have the ppes um but i mean pe people are human beings you cannot basically stick a mask on somebody's face and tell them how many times to wash their hands i must say that i'm proud to be in augusta victoria hospital because we have all the supplies we have face shields we have ppes although we use them and they're running out and we'll continue to need them but at least they're available now and we're encouraging our staff to use them as we have lots of close contact with our patients, when they're dialysis, when they're chemo, you get too close to their face, too close to your patients for treatment, and staff should really even wear their face shields and not just their masks. You know, uh, um, I've brought now uh, 14 or 15 uh, solidarity tour groups to Israel-Palestine since 2001. And Augusta Victoria and the Lutheran World Federation has been one of the main uh, stops for us, uh, and and so uh, Augusta Victoria and the LWF have a special place in our heart. Um, and and for the over 250 travelers who've come with me over the years, I want to say that one of the ministries, and and your predecessor Siglinda Mark Brown uh, has always been very very a welcoming host. Um, and I'm looking forward to meeting you in person, both of you, when I bring my next group next year. Inshallah. Um, yeah. inshallah. Um, one of the ministries that has been very moving for my groups is the uh, mobile uh, mammography uh, clinic, uh, as well as the, uh, uh, the mobile diabetes clinic. The fact that you go into the villages and the great success, I mean, the, the the flipping of the rates in terms of uh, uh, the kind of palliative care for breast cancer patients and, and women's health, the great change it's made in the Palestinian villages in and around Jerusalem. And so I guess I'd like for you to say a word about both of those clinics, but particularly about the mobile mammography unit and women's health care in the villages that Augusta Victoria provides. Either one, please, or both. Or I like both. I'll start and Siglinda will tell you about the bus. <laughs> <laughs> the village health work community started, uh, Augusta Victoria used to have clinics in the communities. When the Palestinian Authority came to be and they took on all the primary healthcare services, we saw that we do not need to run clinics as we were more specializing in oncology and nephrology care. However, we realized we still needed an outreach arm to maintain um, an access from the community to the hospital, especially on a level of screening such as mammography. And uh, we were becoming specialized in uh, non-communicable diseases, hence also diabetes is one of the non-communicable diseases which we were very interested in. And that's why uh, we continued our community services in that aspect. We see the mammography as an essential component to our services because it is unfortunate for me to say as a woman in Palestine that one of the primary killers is breast cancer amongst women in cancer in Palestine when actually the world talks about cure in, in breast cancer in the world. We have very poor early detection. We get patients referred to us, women very late in diagnosis. We see women, young women of young ages. And that's why we focus on the villages. And in fact, uh, I'll let Siglinde say the plans now 
because we've bought a beautiful uh, new mammography uh, stereotactic so that we can digitally start doing the screening and diagnosis and ensuring that these women get referred to us immediately. This is something new we're planning to do to bypass the bureaucracy of the health system because we realized we are ethically obliged when you do screening not to wait for the woman to go and fight her way through the health system to get to follow up to her screening with biopsies and diagnosis. So AVH has taken on now that with all our diagnosed cases in the community, we will be providing the care immediately, even if it's at our own expense, because this is something too complicated to go into in this interview. The ministry has, a, although a generous health insurance system, but the bureaucracy to go into it means you have to be diagnosed to go into it, which means the women could lose that golden period from screening to diagnosis where they can stand a better outcome of cure for them. And Siglinde can go further about our diabetes and our- Yes, um, um, just to add on that, we just got a, a grant last year, which includes a digital mammography, and we have to even, um, you know, construct a, a specific lorry in order to to carry this, and it's a half a million euro <laughs> uh, equipment. So I'm kind of like, I mean, we are really very much looking forward to have this, um, you know, this new machine, and then we want with this um, digital uh, mammography. Um, to to strong to have stronger links to our oncology department, so to um, to not lose the women uh, due to the complicated um, health system, and so we are really mu very much looking forward to it. Um, and of, 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 I mean, you have to also think that during the COVID nineteen uh, period, we could not really run this mobile clinics, which is. Also, which shows us that we have to strengthen our networks in the communities, and this is something that we are going to um, to restructure a bit in in the future. To see, I mean, to really strengthen our networks there, and um, because it's I don't know, but it could be more difficult when we are we, when we want to reach villages in Area C that are under the the danger of being annexed, and then we have to see of how we can deliver our services there. So this is um, this is quite an important thing, and we have we have many other um, events uh, for breast cancer awareness campaigns, and and I think this is all. I mean, it's 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 a very good uh, move, and it brings Augusta Victoria much closer to um, uh, to the rural areas and and to the and to the people because that's. I mean, of course, we have this wonderful hospital here. But then there are people that can't access it. And that's, I mean, that's the whole idea of having a mobile clinic to reach out to those that um, have difficulties to come here or don't really know or have not the means to do so. Um, with the diabetes, um, uh, with the diabetes program, I think that we have also done uh, um, lots of awareness raising and it's now more also to strengthen the networks to um, to increase the kind of capacities of other institutions to, to deal with um, di diabetes because that's more of a public health issue. It's about uh, change of lifestyle. It's not so much, I mean, it, it, it needs other experiences and, and other know-how also because it's not only medical. It's much about how people live their life, how they I mean, if they, uh, you know, how they, uh, how is their diet and uh, do they have, I mean, to understand that what they take into their body is having also uh, an effect. And that's, um, I think this is uh, because diabetes is still a big issue here for, for the palace, for the Palestinian in the Palestinian health um, care system. And we are, we want to be more close also to the to the areas to give the services there where people are, which is mainly the southern part of the West Bank. And this is also what we're going to do to restructure a bit, to have more strengths and capacities in the West Bank. Yeah, thanks for that. Uh, we have a question from one of the nurses in the audience here uh, asking you uh, about the, what's the primary cause for renal failure uh, and uh, um, is transplantation uh, something that you all do? Is that a reality uh, at your hospital or in the West Bank? Um, unfortunately, yes. I know when I say we have that many kids, people usually go, oh, 
um, and that there, and one of them, one of our children has been with us for 20 years. He's a young man now. He's a, studied to be a lawyer and he's still with us. Thank, thankfully we have, we, he's still living, but uh, unfortunately there's a lot of consanguinity issues. We have at least three, four families. We have the brothers, two brothers or a brother and sister dialyzing. We have lots of blood marriage and that's when we were saying, and, and in certain districts like the South, it's still very traditional in that way. The other issues is most probably there has been lot, some serious infections in their young ages that went unnoticed. And in fact, when you mentioned about dialysis and children coming from Gaza, we get babies coming from Gaza just for the diagnosis. Of course, you can't dialyze a child or a baby that comes from Gaza because they'll have to stay here endlessly. But we get babies coming at four months, six months to be diagnosed with like the kidney problems. And these children are a whole different story as they get weaned and have to come with a grandmother. And not only are they sick, they cry incessantly. And we that's a whole advocacy issue on its own. But um, no, unfortunately, the main reasons are these two reasons. And that's why then transplant becomes another challenge because you can't find a donor from among the family. And unfortunately, Palestinians don't have a transplant system. This is one of the things on the strategy of Augusta Victoria Hospital for the next five years, hopefully, that we have to start considering it. Because, and also within the Israeli health system, Palestinians cannot go on any list. I mean, there's no uh, transplant list for Palestinians to enroll on for transplant people. Sometimes get lucky, they go to nearby uh, Arab countries like Jordan, if they have a relative or they find some, somebody. And, um, and this is one of our heartbreakers because we feel we really need to work on it systematically to try and provide um, transplant, but it's not easier said than done, as I said, because many of them are due to consanguinity. And so, and yeah. there is still no system of cadaver donor donation in Palestine either. One of the, uh, thank you for that. Uh, one, of the, one of the current projects, and it's a very important and needed ministry uh, is the Elder Care and Palliative Medicine Institute that's going to almost double the capacity of the hospital. I know that you are, according to your annual report, I know you were uh, hoping to secure all your permits and, and break ground in 2019. How's it going? How, how are you doing with the Institute? Uh, were you able to do accomplish everything you wanted in 2019? Well, if I, yes, I mean, this is the elderly care and uh, palliative medical center. So we had really, we had strong hopes that we would start with groundwork in March. And we have the building license. Uh, we, we, we got the building license, I think, after seven years of hard work. And we erected uh, a construction fence and, you know, to, to mark the area and to also protect the area. And then uh, COVID-19 hit and everything was put on hold. Also our funder, uh, our donor said that for the time being, um, things would be put on hold. Now that we are out of the, out of the lockdown, we are hoping to resume the work. We have gotten uh, positive um, signals from UNRWA, who is the implementing partner in Jerusalem. Um, but up until now, we're still waiting. So, I mean, the documents are already uh, also for the tenders, for the contractors to start, um, you know, submitting their, their offers for the tenders. And we are waiting for the last clearance from the donor on the documents to go ahead to publish. And then of course, contractors need like two months of time to present something so that hopefully by the end of the year, um, you know, work would continue, but I have to say that things are, well, they take time and up until now we have the fence, but no groundwork, but of course we're still hoping that this is going to start uh, in 2020, but it was a bit of a setback, as you can imagine with COVID-19. And we're hoping, yeah, we're hoping not to lose our uh, building license. Say because it's, about it's the, the need for this, uh, for this uh, institute. Elder care and uh, the palliative, uh, uh, the palliative medicine institute. Say a word about why you're investing so much of your energy and time and money in this kind of a, an institute. Because this is palliative care is a new concept which is not really 
uh, which is not really known. And it's it's not only, I mean, it, it means like you look at the person in a, in a holistic way that, um, uh, you know, after treatment with cancer or any other diseases that uh, the person can um, be treated in dignity, that they don't have pain, that they are cared for. Because uh, I'm also increasingly here in the society, the families are not able anymore to deal you know, with, you know, with their elderly that need intensive care or with people that, you know, have, uh, they have diseases and, and still need um, to, to have a um, quality of life. So th that is a new concept which we want to, uh, to introduce into the Palestinian healthcare system. And it's a real need. That's, I think this is why we got also the, the, the building license from, um, from the Israeli authorities, because there, are, there is a lack. Um, also, here we are dealing with an aging um, society and with more need for care for the elderly. And um, I think that that Augusta Victoria is is very much very well prepared to do that because we have our oncology. We are we are already dealing with people in a very specific in a very specific life you know part of their life cycle. And uh, so it, it, it's supposed to have 140 beds. Um, so it's, it's, it would be, I mean, once it started, it would be one of the biggest construction uh, projects in East Jerusalem. And people are asking questions. When is your hospital ready? Because they're thinking either of their parents or of themselves to have a safe place to know when they need help and they can't be treated anywhere else that they could go, that they would come here. And I think, um, Yes, I think they also expect um, a very high standard of, of, of treatment and dignity in that for, yeah, from that institution. If, if I, I may add... add up on that. And Dina, when you, when, as you, as you uh, answer this question too, could you say a word about how many, how many patients uh, Augusta Victoria uh, serves uh, in a year right. on average? Uh, well, basically, um, we we have done the. I just want to continue about the palliative care. Um, sure. What Siglende said, we are already a lead in that we have the only skilled nursing facility on our premises. It's a it's an it's a ward within our hospital, although we said oncology and nephrology, but we have the only skilled nursing facility ward for the elderly. Uh, in our hospital in the whole of the Palestinian territories. There's no other like it. Within the Israeli health system, there are similar awards, but we pride ourselves that we have a very good outcome of, um, of uh, um, uh, pressure sores, healing, uh, treating like Siglinda said, of people elderly with dignity and within their same culture. This is very important. Yeah. You know, Palestinians want to be cared for in their older age with dignity with Palestinians. Yes. And uh, and that's why. And then as we integrated palliative care already in our services, we realized the need. And so that will be more encompassing. I just wanted to add that we're already there. Um, the numbers, I mean, we have at least on a daily basis, we have a thousand people usually coming through our doors. We have something like 11,000 people treating them annually, but uh, our numbers in the, under the COVID have gone down tremendously because of Gaza. I mean, we've had and the last two months, we've had no patients coming from Gaza, but we still have some coming for the radiation. Even radiation people have been defaulting. But uh, so this year, uh, the COVID has hit the access to care, which also will affect the patients tremendously. Um, also, the, I think the financial situation has affected transfers. Uh, the Palestinian Authority, unfortunately, sometimes think they are saving lives by not referring them to a tertiary center and referring them to other uh, you know, uh, uh, centers where they think there are doctors when actually oncology care is not managed by just doctors. It's a whole system. It's a whole system that includes multidisciplinary teams, safety, quality. And this is an ongoing challenge for us in advocating for our patients with our Palestinian Authority as well. Um, and as finances are cut under a political situation as well, I mean, you know, since the United States also cut all funding to the PA, their financial situation has been challenging. And we as East Jerusalem hospitals have been affected. I have visited with Mark Brown on the Hill to try to advocate for at least maintaining these kind of fundings for East Jerusalem hospitals because we deal with the humanitarian cases. We are in the business of caring for people 
and that's our priority. I'm going to get to thank you for raising the issue of funding. I'm going to get to that in a little bit uh, before we leave, but I wanted to uh, address this to Siglinda um, to give you a chance uh, to talk about the other ministries of the Lutheran World Federation uh, Jerusalem program, and three in particular, Siglinda. Um, I want you to say a word about the vocational training program, the affordable housing project, and the Mount of Olives sports fields. And uh, we're, uh, with regard to the last one, uh, it's one of the few green spaces, right, uh, left in uh, East Jerusalem. And if I recall correctly, uh, sadly, there's a settlement, right, built right at the base of your property on the Mount of Olives. And it butts up against the sports fields too, if I remember correctly. Anyway, those three, vocational training, affordable housing project, and the sports fields, if you could say a word about each one of those. Yes, we have uh, two vocational training schools uh, for youth, um, uh, men and women, uh, one in Betanina, which is uh, East Jerusalem, and, and one in Ramallah. And as you can imagine, it's becoming more and more important to provide skills for, for youth that they can make a living and then and can have also like some meaning in their life. So for instance, um, in, in Betanina, we could manage to uh, do some renovation this year, also with the help of a, of a grant for uh, to make it accessible for people with disabilities. So now we have uh, we have an escalator and we have something like a ramp, you know, that you can go up the, the stairs with um, with a wheelchair, which is which is a, a real challenge. But also, I think we we want to be a model in this um, uh, in this field. Um, we have a lot of, um, uh, you know, young men and women, more men, of course, I would say that in Jerusalem that come from from difficult background families, they uh, they are, you know, um, referred to us from from social workers from the east from the Jerusalem mon municipality, and uh, so we have also social workers that you know that help them to get over their issues. And they come from families which uh, that um, you know are in precarious situations. They have maybe not really, they were not really able to um, to get the you know to, to to get through the school. So and and unfortunately, vocational training here in this country, not everywhere else, but especially here, has kind of a stigma for those that are dropping out. I mean, normally you should go to the university, whereas if you learn your skills. Uh, as a technician or as a carpenter or as a plumber or auto mechanic or all these different um, vocational trainings that, that we are uh, offering, you will find jobs. And uh, so like also what we are trying to do and that it was called, of course, also difficult um, during COVID-19 that we have um, a, a strong partnerships with the private sector and with companies that would take on some of the students in their second year. If they, if they are there for a two year course that in the second year, it would be less theoretical, but more practical in the market. Sure. And very often that is an opening to also get employment. So sometimes really uh, the parents come and tell us, well, our child has changed 100 percent. So this is this is really uh, this is great. And we have now in Ramallah we have an additional project uh, which looks into especially to de uh, develop new professions for females and for for people with disabilities. And we're going to do that um, together with other uh, vocational training institutes. Um, to, to help them to, uh, you know, to renovate their facilities that it's also more accessible for people with disabilities. We want to have ambassadors, um, yes, ambassadors from vocational training students, graduates. So you could say like uh, that we are looking for role models that would reach out to the communities to talk to parents, to talk to youth groups, to tell them what is available um, and, and, you know, to make it more attractive to um, yeah, to, to do a practical work. So we have great hopes. There is a lot of interest for donors because especially also in, in East Jerusalem because everybody is looking. This is also when you mentioned the sports field, it's the same thing. Donors want to upgrade uh, the sports field. Unfortunately, it's not really possible our sports field here because we have this issue with the, um, with the settlement. We can't because otherwise we could 
you know, have some uh, some benches there for people to, to sit or to, you know, to have a little garden, to have uh, cabins to for changing and showers and so on. So there would be money and interest there. But because of the, the difference and, and the issue of um, of the land, we, we can't do that. But the whole idea is um, for everybody now, how can you, what can you do for the Palestinian news, especially in East Jerusalem, because they're, they're somehow disintegrated um, and they're, they're, they are somehow left alone. And, and I think this is something that really also more people look, uh, look uh, into because there's still 300,000 Palestinians living in East Jerusalem and they have, um, they have very limited chances to, to social services. So that's something that we, we want to increase and we're um, looking really forward to that. Now, one word on the uh, affordable housing project. Um, after a long, you know, all the trials, I think, you know, for Mark Brown, you might be even know more than I do because he was, you know, he was working for so many years on this, but um, we have decided now that uh, we want to try um, to have a construction area for affordable housing in Betanina on two plots that is all, that are owned by the LWF and it's just opposite the vocational training center. Um, it's already part of the uh, center is already used by the church once a week for their gatherings. Um, and so we have two plots and there is there are no obstacles. So it's a residential area. There are no issues there on the land ownership. What we need to do <coughs> is to unify the, the two plots to one plot, which is a procedure on itself in order to have um, a, a bigger you know uh, scope for for building apartments so this is what we're trying to do now we have opened a file uh, in the municipality it was of course all delayed due to COVID-19 but we we are expecting that within the next one and a half years we could have the the, um, the building license and could start construction and we are now in the you know setting up kind of uh, information leaflets together with Mark to start some fundraising there is also a housing committee with uh, European partners from church, from Lutheran churches. They're also very interested. It's not as big. It's a very humble contribution, I would say, to the housing needs of the of the uh, the Christians in in East Jerusalem, uh, because of the whole issue of people not being able to afford housing, which means they would have to find other housing in the West Bank, and then with that they would lose their residency rights in Jerusalem and all their social benefits. And um, so, but it's a humble, I would say it's a very humble contribution. I, I did want to ask you about funding. So uh, thanks for introducing that. Uh, when we were at Augusta Victoria and the LWF office in 2018, uh, President Trump had just suspended US financial support, uh, which had impacted for the Palestinian Authority, which had impacted LWF's funding. I read that Germany recently provided 700,000 euros to help you in your fight against the COVID virus. From what other countries are you receiving your support and, and where are things standing these days regarding US financial support? Uh, there is no US financial support at the moment. So, but I wanted you to say, I wanted, you, I wanted to hear it from you just in case I missed something. No, no, I mean, we have missed the three installments um, uh, before, I mean, it's you know we um, we 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 are getting annual um, support from the European Union mechanism PEGAS, uh, in which European member states um, you know can can uh, provide earmarked funds to specific sectors in order to help the Palestinian Authority to uh, you know and and it's also this. Uh, this mechanism is somehow linked also to some kind of reform within the Palestinian Authority. So, and and the East Jerusalem Hospital Network is benefiting from the this mechanism for the hospitals. But it's also this mechanism is also there for education and for other sectors. And uh, we have lost now. I mean, it's it's a real loss, and nobody has covered up for the for the loss of the American uh, funding. And there at, at the moment, there we have absolutely no funding from the US. Lots of uh, projects had to stop also with other, organiz I mean, other organizations. They just 
they didn't even have a like a grace period it just stopped and what about um, other arab countries what about other arab countries yes i mean the ecpmi the elderly care center is funded by the islamic development bank and the biggest funder uh, are the, is the saudi fund the biggest shareholder is the saudi fund and um they have also helped us with the palliative care the, the child ward Care, so we have a lot of um, good contact with, um, you know, with that fund and um, other donors. Where, like, as I said, the 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 pig, um, the European country, some of the European countries. So this Pegas mechanism, and uh, Germany, and also Norway, the Netherlands. Um, I don't and Italy. No, I don't think that it was a national. So I don't want to. I mean, it's not a comprehensive list. Sure. But um, I have to say that that lots of our partners came to our support because I think they are aware of what we are dealing here. I mean, Augusta Victoria Hospital is not only a hospital, but it's a it's a Jerusalem institution, and it's a, you know it's it's kind of safeguarding the East Jerusalem for the Palestinians in a sense. Also, I mean, it's um, and for the time being. As we, as we said, there are no other places for some of the, the treatment, there are no other places where Palestinians can go. And I think this is, this is very well known by the donors. But of course, um, the, I mean, I can only reiterate that our financial situation is very fragile. We don't have lots of you know, space. And it would be very good if with a new US administration, you know, the aid would, Come Inshallah. at some point. If, um... <laughs> Don't sound hopeful, Michael. <laughs> uh, uh, you had talked about uh, uh, advocating on Capitol Hill with Mark Brown, Dina, and maybe both of you could answer this. I believe a number of years ago, uh, Dr. Jill Biden, wife of Joe Biden, brought with her some medical equipment and other U.S. aid for Augusta Victoria. Of course, this was a, a uh, a few years ago. What, what did you find when you were uh, with Mark uh, Dina on Capitol Hill? Uh, who, who are your chief friends, advocates? Uh, are you finding any support? Uh, uh, and then the follow-up question, I'm looking around the screen here, and so many of these people are, are activists in their own communities and with Palestine Israel networks nationally. What can we do to help? And, and, and who have you found to be those kind of organizations here in the US or, or congressional folks who we can approach? I mean, that's, that's a big question for me. It was my first experience. It was humbling to see how much work has to go into actually trying to lobby on the Hill for supporting us in AVH. Um, uh, so it was new. I mean, people would. Uh, some people were completely were completely surprised by the stories when we mentioned stories about access and children coming from Gaza. They didn't know anything about it. Some people felt there would be no solution except if the government would change. Um, I must say, um, we were all trying to see. I mean, the advocacy was amongst all the U.S. Uh, NGOs as well who were working in Palestine, like. Uh, all the American NGOs trying to see how they could fix that um, um, that uh, act to get the funds through because it was affecting all the humanitarian aid they were doing in Palestine and the Middle East. So I cannot really answer to say who your friends or things, but I really believe that uh, they are everyone is responsible. The US is part of the international community that is responsible for the Palestinians because uh, they, uh, Palestine and East Jerusalem specifically, and for us, is occupied territories. Even if Trump decided to call Israel, to call Jerusalem annexed and move the embassy, which has never happened under any uh, US president, uh, this is violation of international uh, law and all the UN resolutions for the occupation of East Jerusalem. We are Palestinians living in East Jerusalem. I'm a daughter of a man who was born in East Jerusalem. My grandfather's house still stands in west of Jerusalem that he had built and left in 1948 when he was ethnically cleansed. And so the international community is obliged to bear their duty towards occupied territories. And Israel is obliged to support the health services that we have a right to in our own country. 
And so really, I mean, that question should be asked who the people, how do they feel their responsibility towards us? But we feel people are responsible. They can go blatantly denying all UN resolutions and also doing uh, using double, uh, double measures for against Israel as against other countries in the world. You know, uh, it, you have to either stand for all UN resolutions and human rights and advocate for it, but don't use uh, double standards and use one standards with Israel against us as Palestinians and another standard for other oppressive countries that, uh, that uh, uh, the US works against. And that's all I have to say. It was a humbling experience. I thank all the people. We still had follow up visits by Congress people who were very uh, listening and could understand the situation. But at the end of the day, we need some action. And we have learned that Israel doesn't care for any resolutions and only actions towards people's rights. Thank you. Yeah, uh, who from, uh, maybe both of you can answer this one, who from the US Congress uh, uh, has visited Augusta Victoria or oh, the Luther Road I Federation can't. offices? I can't remember now. I think you should ask Mark Brown or Siglendi. Yes, I, no, I, I'm also not so familiar. And, and I, have, I have to say that like almost, uh, you know, we had we had uh, some visits, uh, you know, anticipated and in our program from staffers also from the Congress. And it was quite an impressive list, but then they couldn't come. So I didn't meet too many people since I'm here because of, of the, the situation. So I really do think that, that Mark Brown is the best person to, uh -huh. to, to, to ask this. And um, well, yes, I mean, we haven't had uh, visitors, I would think since February. I mean, this is, has never been like this, I don't think. Mark, why don't you uh, unmute yourself uh, and then uh, uh, and come on and answer that. Yeah, thanks yeah. for offering, Mark. <laughs> Mark, go ahead. Oh, I have to unmute you, Mark. Okay, well, let me see then. <laughs> I'm trying to unmute you. Okay, there we go. All right, oh, good, Mark. Yeah. Yeah. There he is. Hey, there's the man. Hey, Mark, right. go ahead. Well, uh, yeah, great to hear from Dina and Siglinda. Dina, of course, is, is exactly correct uh, about, the, <clears throat> about the Congress and uh, what our prospects are there. Um, uh, one way is, is, is to look at the letter. I think about 180 Democrats uh, signed a letter regarding um, uh, annexation. Uh, opposing annexation, and you have about 120 Republicans who signed a letter uh, basically supporting the president's approach to annexation. So that leaves you uh, another 120 or 130 people in the House of Representatives, uh, Republicans and Democrats, who uh, are not declared. And I, and I think uh, it's important for people to to look at those two letters, see if their member of Congress uh, is on either one of them, and then also to go after all of those um, who, who didn't declare themselves one way or the other uh, at that time. Uh, it's, 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 yeah, hopefully there's gonna be some changes and, um, and the goodwill that's generated I think by these visitors to Augusta Victoria Hospital, um, uh, many have visited over the years, um, uh, but that needs to be followed up with uh, with a lot of uh, advocacy. And of course, um, in every contact with a member of Congress, whether it's House or Senate, to uh, encourage them to be uh, visiting uh, Palestinian uh, places, especially uh, Augusta Victoria, where there is so much involvement uh, of USAID over the years. Uh, you mentioned the visit of, of the uh, Second Lady Jill Biden um, back in, I think, 2011. And of course, that solidified the um, AVH acquiring uh, its 
at that time, um, second medical linear accelerator. Uh, and um, so I think, you know, there's certainly an interest, there's some past knowledge there. Um, uh, uh, so if people have a, a contact with, with the Bidens in any way, uh, I think it would be good to remind them if you've visited Jerusalem, if you've visited AVH to, to, to make the connection, uh, to try to um, push that there would be, uh, you know, some very positive things in the democratic platform, not only about annexation um, specifically, but opposing the occupation generally. Uh, and to continue to always mention the need for uh, freeing up the funding for all of the uh, East Jerusalem hospitals, as well as other uh, USAID funding. Um, yeah. I, um, Thanks, Mark. Yeah. Yeah, I appreciate you jumping in because uh, you bring a certain kind of uh, uh, history, you know, uh, to... Uh, uh, not only the work there, but then the advocacy on Capitol Hill. And thanks for your continued advocacy on Capitol Hill these days, Mark, uh, part of the ELCA. Uh, Siglinda and Dina, uh, I have one last question for you before we close. Uh, um, both of you uh, are trained as nurses. Uh, Dina, uh, one of your areas of expertise is infection prevention. You're both administrators now. Uh, how has your training as nurses on the front lines of patient care, how does that, how does that color, how does that benefit you in your roles as administrators? Answer that for us, please. Which one would you like, which one of you wants to start? Let's see Glenda start. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a long time ago that I was a nurse. But you know what, I think what I learned when I was a nurse, you had, to, um, you had to look at the individual patient. You had to make sure that, that the individual patient gets all the treatment and everything and you know the, the, the meals at the right time, the medication. You have to see that the, that the patient has to go to, you know, on time to certain diagnostic, um, uh, investigations and so on and at the same time you have to look at the whole world you have to look at 20 or 30 people you have to make sure that everything is is running so I think what I learned from being a nurse is to um, to to um, focus on the individual but not forget the you know the the overall uh, the, the bigger uh, the bigger picture and I think this is something which really helped me in in also my other career and uh, to understand that that also people might, you know, especially patients, they they feel very vulnerable. They don't know what's happening. They they lose control once they are in the hospital, and that you have to to anticipate and you have to support them that they feel that they have the things again in in their hand or that they feel safe. So I mean, as a, as a patient, you are very vulnerable. They are very dependent. And this is something that um, I think you, you have to, as a nurse, and also as an administrator, you have to think of if you if you have to if you look at the whole operations. So that, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Um, I, I will say it in a nutshell. I think when people ask me what would you have done differently, I'll say I would. If I were to live my life, I would live it the same all over again. I started from an operating room to public health, and then through my infection control and working nationally. So, and now at AVH, I think um, nursing really prepares you to think risks, to manage more than one thing at one time and to think holistically. And most importantly, what I'm using in this is, uh, is advocating for people um, really remembering. Uh, it was very comfortable for me to come to AVH as I think my nursing prepared me to be in line with the vision and mission of, of AVH about advocating for patients, advocating for staff, for their dignity, for supporting them and for patients treating them and at the same time protecting the institution when thinking of risk. 
And uh, so really, I'm happy that I had that background. And I think it also helped me think on my feet against everything we're happening today. Mm. I sort of think it equipped me to think very quickly on my feet. And that's how I've been able to give to every age. Thank you. So Siglinda and Dina, thanks for coming today. Do you have any parting words for us? And Mark uh, as well, I'll let the three of you kind of uh, close up uh, our interview today. So Mark and then uh, Siglinda and then Dina. Well, I, I would just uh, say thank you to you, Michael, for, for pulling this together, this and, uh, and other webinars. That's really uh, important. And um, the ELCA is also working to um, pull some more webinars together that will um, hopefully bring in a, an international crowd that, that can focus. Uh, and I, to say thank you to you, but to, to say thank you uh, to Siglinda and to Dina, uh, you know, just really carrying on in, um, you know, tremendously difficult circumstances and, um, and so gracefully and so faithfully. So um, just, just to say thank you for that. Thank you, Mark. Sigrunda, it's good to see you, Mark. Sigrunda? Yes, I want to thank you, uh, Michael, and, and your group and all the, the people in the US that are really, that are caring and that are interested in to know what the situation is. Because, uh, I mean, with this looming annexation, with this COVID, with this pandemic, with this, uh, you know, this kind of economic crisis, which we will soon see, because there are no tourists, there's nobody coming in. I don't know how people are going to survive. There is a real vacuum uh, that the US is not, is not, you know, not involved anymore, uh, involved in a very biased way. So I really want to thank you for your engagement. And I want to encourage you to raise your voice because we really need you. People here are kind of desperate. Um, they have lost hope. Um, and um, so thank you for, for your interest, for your engagement. And please, please keep doing it because the looming annexation is really something which which would be, if implemented, if the US plan would be implemented, it would be, be having a very difficult impact. Thank you, Siglinda. Dina? Um, anything you do will make a difference. So please do something. <laughs> and even though COVID has separated everyone socially, I think we should still think of others because this world has become virtual now. And we must know that anything we do will touch somebody somewhere else. So take action somehow, somewhere, and you will make a difference. Thank you. Well, thanks to both of you. I just want to assure you that to the people who have tuned in to us today from all around the country, and even I see some friends from Jerusalem and uh, uh, elsewhere in Palestine, what the Lutheran uh, World Federation uh, is doing in, uh, in, in its Jerusalem program and throughout the Middle East, and particularly the programs of Augusta Victoria, they are very, very close to our heart. And so I, I want to just second what Mark said. Mark, thank you for all your years of service. And to Siglinda and Dina, thank you. And please pass along our thanks to your wonderful, dedicated staff. Thank you for all thank their you. sacrifices day by day. So I want to thank you. Thanks to all of you for coming today.